Hi, my name is April Hewlett, and I'm with the University of Idaho, and today in our Rangeland Principles course, we get to talk about Rangeland Animal Habitat. What is a habitat? A habitat can be defined as the home of a species. Habitats, or the house, the home, the natural abode, have several different components that make up the habitat. We have a biotic factors, things like plants and animals and how they interact create a home environment. We have climatic factors such as temperature and elevation, what's going to be most suitable for certain animals. We have edaphic factors, and here we're referring to soil. We have physical properties like texture and structures, but we also have chemical structures like cation exchange capacity or pH. How does that affect the life or the home of the animal that we're interested in? When we talk about habitat, we have four basic elements that are requirements for different populations. These requirements limit the size, the growth, and or the quality of the animal population. These four elements are food, water, cover, and space. We're going to talk about each of these elements starting with food. So food, we have energy, nutrient, and minerals. All of these things are a requirement for an animal's home or habitat. Energy comes from starches, sugars, fats, and cellulose. Nutrients come from proteins and vitamins. Minerals mostly come from phosphorus and potassium. We can't think about energy without also thinking about cellulose. Cellulose is the most abundant source of energy on rangelands. It is essentially a carbohydrate that forms the skeleton of most plant structures and plant cells. It's also a great source for dietary fiber. When we think about how animals process cellulose, we can break them into three different types of categories. We have concentrate selectors, ruminants, and hindgut fermenters. And this affects what type of habitat they use and also, when we think about habitat structure or we think about restoring habitat, we have to understand what types of animals are going to be present so we can make sure that we meet their needs and requirements for food. Concentrate selectors cannot digest cellulose or they have a difficult time using cellulose. These are often our herbivores or our plant eaters. They graze and they browse vegetation, if you remember from the last class period. They get a lot of their energy from simple carbohydrates like sugar and starches by eating roots and berries, seeds, young shoots, where cellulose is present but maybe not concentrated. Another type of concentrate selectors are carnivores or meat eaters. If you recall from last class, carnivores cannot break down cellulose so they get their energy and nutrients from preformed compounds, and these preformed compounds is meat. Here they search, hunt, and they consume other animals to get their energy. The last type of concentrate selectors are omnivores, and if you recall, omnivores get their energy and nutrients from plants and animals. Ruminants are the next type of animal we'll discuss, and ruminants have specialized four-pire stomachs with microbes that break down the cellulose. And it starts by these enlarged fermentation organs, which are the reticulum and the rumen. And these house these microbes, which are bacteria and protozoa, that break down the cellulose into volatile fatty acids, or VFAs. This can then be used as energy by the ruminant animals. These organs are uh, before the intestine where they start to absorb nutrients, so not only do they get energy from date breaking down cellulose, but they also can utilize the bacteria and protozoa as a source of protein when they die. The last type of animal we'll talk about is hindgut fermenters. And examples of these, as you can see in the pictures, would be horses or rabbits. In hindgut fermenters, they have an enlarged cecum that has microbes or the bacteria and protozoa, similar to the ruminants, that break down cellulose. One of the major differences between ruminants and cecum or hindgut fermenters is the, um, the location of the cecum. It's actually after the absorptive areas of the intestines, so although it does break down cellulose and provides some energy, 
There's also a loss in uh, proteins from the bacteria and protozoa because they are after the absorptive area. So they require a little bit more food, which we'll talk about next. So the next thing to think about when we're considering food and habitat is how much do the species eat that we want to be in that habitat? We want to make sure that we have adequate forage or food for the different animals. And each of the different types that we talked about eat a little bit um, differently or different amounts of food each day. So the concentrate selectors, for example, eat about 0.25% of their body weight each day. So according to the Fish and Wildlife Service website, for example, a sage grouse hen weighs between two and three pounds. So let's say we have a three pound hen and we want to calculate how much forage it's going to eat each day. We would times the three by 0.25% to get um, an estimated forage amount that it requires. And that would be 0.075 pounds per day. Ruminants, on the other hand, they eat about 2.5% of their body weight each day. So let's say that we have a 1,000-pound cow, for example. And this 1,000-pound cow eats 2.5% of their body weight each day. So if we multiply that out, we can see that a ruminant's going to eat about 25 pounds of forage per day. The hindgut fermenter, they eat about 3% of their body weight. So whether that's a horse or a rabbit in the examples, they're going to eat a little bit more than the ruminant and the concentrate selectors. So let's say we have an 1,100 pound horse and we know that it eats about 3% of its body weight. So if we multiply that out, we can see that it eats about 30, 33 pounds per day. So these are just general um, estimates of what the forage intake is for these different types of animals. Another aspect that we want to think about is the diet preference of the animals that we are trying to manage our habitat for. And I like this diagram because it, it shows kind of the range of diet preferences and different um, ungulates. So you can see on the bottom we have grass, forbs, and shrubs and trees, or browse is what we call them. And above that we have different animals with bars. And the length of the bard that's overlaying the grass, forb, or shrub is what they prefer. So example, at the top would be cattle. And cattle's bar is mainly over grasses. This is primarily what they're going to eat. Sheep, on the other hand, kind of span between grasses, forbs, and browse. But forbs are definitely more dominant in this situation. Goats, later on, or lower on the bars, you can see that they prefer more browse than they do forbs. Although they can eat both, most of their diet's gonna come from browse. So obviously food is a critical factor of habitat, but also water is another basic element that is a requirement for any kind of habitat. And water requirements are gonna vary depending on the animal and depending on the weather and the climate. Think about uh, when you drink water. Do you think you drink more water in the summer when it's hot or in the winter when it's cool? These same things influence how much water different animals are going to drink. Here's just some general ideas of what an animal might average out or typically drink. So a sheep you can see is one to one and a half gallons every day or every two days. Um, donkeys are three to four gallons once a day, so um, quite a bit more than the sheep. And you can see cattle and bison are even more with eight to ten gallons uh, every one to two days. So it's obviously going to fluctuate by the species, but don't forget about weather and the climate and really the activity level of the different animals. So there's multiple ways that animals can actually get water just like humans. And although I said in the previous slide that they drink it, they can also eat it and get water. That contributes to that total that we saw in the previous slide. So the moisture content of forage provides water to the species. So immature grass or newly growing grass can be up to 75% water. So if you think back to our uh, discussion on fire and after fire, when we have that green new growth, obviously animals are going to like it because it has a high water content. 
One of the things that you will do as a land manager is think about constructing different water sources for livestock and for wildlife species. And perhaps you've heard of guzzlers, for example. These are often put out for wildlife and livestock. And basically it's a, a catchment for water. When we construct these different water sources, we always want to make sure that we have some kind of ladder that allows different animals to get out of the trough if they fall in or if they decide that they want to go and play in the water. Um, oftentimes, if the water starts to decrease in level, it just starts to dry out, animals can get trapped inside. So one of the big pushes right now is to really make sure that all of our guzzlers and troughs that we create have these wildlife ladders so they can be compatible with multiple different species and still give access to water to the animals that need it. The third basic element that we're going to talk about is cover. And cover can be important for a lot of different factors. One, it can provide shade in summer when um, temperatures rise. It can provide shelter from cold and wind in the winter. So we want to make sure that we leave some kind of shelter there when we're doing any kind of restoration activity, for example. It also offers visual obstruction, which is really important for a lot of different species. It's important because it helps protect their young and uh, really can help them hide from different predators. This is a great picture to kind of think about some of the factors that you'd want to consider when you're thinking about cover specifically in habitat. And this is a picture of a juniper treatment where some of the juniper, which we learned is a native plant that is oftentimes invasive into sagebrush steppe habitats, has been removed. And we want to make sure that when we do any kind of treatment, that we still have continuity in our different habitats so that we don't have wide open spaces for different animals um, it, and we don't have these barriers that they can't cross. So in this example, let's think about a deer. So if we remove juniper and brush, we oftentimes will improve forage because we're removing something that's using a lot of water that then can be utilized by more grasses and shrubs. And so we have an increase in our forage, but if we do this really large continuous area, we're also removing cover or thermal protection and hiding places for the deer. So you have to kind of think about it on both sides. You want to improve forage, but you also need to make sure that it has the cover essentially, or that's essential for it to uh, thrive. Here are just two more examples of some treatments in a sagebrush area. And in these pictures, you can see that uh, the treatments obviously have removed some of the shrubs, and this would likely increase some of the grasses and forbs, which are good for wildlife and livestock. But you can also see how they have left different strips and blocks of brush that provide um, a continuity or even corridors for travel of different wildlife species that need that cover to move. And this is always something to think about when planning any kind of treatments. You want to make sure that you're not fragmenting the habitat, but instead you're manipulating it so you still have the requirements of cover for different animals so they can travel and they can move around. The last basic element we'll talk about is space. And space becomes really interesting, especially when you're thinking about multi-species or managing for multi-species. So if you're doing birds, for example, you want to make sure that you understand what space is required for different meat breeding and nesting practices. How far are they going to move between breeding and nesting? And how much do they need once um, they have nested and have uh, juveniles with them? What's the home range of your species? It's going to vary, right? Obviously, an elk, for example, is going to have a larger home range than probably like a beetle, but both critical um, different animals. You also want to consider the social intolerance of animals. So on the bottom, you can see that we have a map of winter range, which is at the lowest elevation, all the way up to summer range. And if you think about kind of the climate patterns of, of like a mountain or hills, where do you think you're going to have um, most of the animals 
or when do you think you're going to have most of the animals that have interactions? So winter typically is the time when the competition is going to be the highest between animals because they're forced into lower areas or the same areas. So the social intolerance really becomes a big deal based on seasonality. Disease transmission is another thing you have to consider when you're thinking about space and when you're thinking about managing for different species. Here's just an article below that you can skim over. Um, it basically talks about domestic sheep and their interaction that they have with bighorn. And maybe you've heard about this, but when they have interactions, they have this pneumonia-like um, disease that spreads from the domestic sheep to the bighorn sheep, and it kills a lot of the bighorn sheep. So you have to think about how disease is going to be transmitted and and really how it's going to be transmitted between different animals. Another factor to think about when you're considering space is fences. So fences have pros and cons. Fences definitely can restrict movement, but they also can produce an edge effect that can benefit some wildlife species. For example, they can produce cover through the accumulation of snow which therefore has more plant growth in the spring, which can provide a different habitat for different species. Fences can also provide perch points for different birds. So whether that's good or bad, I mean, you can, that's something to consider when you're thinking about fences. Uh, here's just an example of fences and pronghorns. Pronghorns typically go under a fence, and so a lot of times when we're Putting up fences, we want to make sure we have a smooth wire on the bottom so that antelope or pronghorn um, can access different areas and, and the fence doesn't become a barrier. Here's an example of a fence that has fence markers on it. And uh, this was a big push for sage grouse uh, habitats. And um, sage grouse, they fly low and they can fly up to 50 miles per hour. And so you can understand that fences might be difficult to see if you're going that fast. So these markers can make a tremendous difference in their ability to avoid a fence and to avoid death. So um, these are all over if you're in the range. Just walk around and I'm sure you'll see some. So each of those four requirements is a limiting factor. Without one of them, just like in this barrel, we can't have an effective habitat that meets different population needs for animals. And one of the options that you have if, with a range degree is to become a restoration ecologist. And a lot of the work we do is focused on habitat restoration. And so when we're doing this kind of exercise or we're trying to restore a different habitat, we'll consider each of these factors and make sure that it's intact. So then animals will come back into the area. We want to make sure that we have sufficient food, that we have water available to the different species. They have to have cover, otherwise they're not going to come. And we have to consider space. What kind of social interactions are they going to have? What is their home range requirements? And we want to make sure that we have all four of these to create a nice habitat for multi-species on rangelands.